Good morning, everyone. This is Lorna Costantini, and I'm pleased to welcome you all today, Classroom 2.0 Live, on behalf of, on behalf of my co-host, Kim Case and Peggy George. We're so happy to have Kim back. She's not been well for the past few weeks, and we're looking forward to her energy as she takes over the question and answer period today. Peggy, unfortunately, has a friend, close friend passed away, so she won't be with us this morning because she's attending a funeral. But she did send her best wishes to everyone and uh, hopes we have a great session today, which I know we're going to because our special guest today is Bill Farrader. And our subject today is going to be teaching the I generation. So we have some fantastic sharing. I've seen some of his, uh, his links ready to share, and uh, I'm really excited to see the information that we're going to be able to receive from all of Bill's hard work. I always ask this question at the beginning of the session. Are there any new people with us today? Someone who's not been to the show before at all. Underneath the participants window, you'll see a green check. And if you're new, would you click on that green check for me so I have an idea who's been with us before? Well, great. Fantastic to see some new people. Really, we're very happy that you could be with us today. So I'm just going to take a quick uh, tour to show you how the how you can participate today and what you might expect to happen right away. You've got the polling feature with the green check and the red X. We do have some poll questions in a minute, which I'll ask you to participate in. If you're happy or sad, there's some emoticons here. You can uh, give uh, Bill a smiley face or clap in uh, support of his uh, presentation. If you want to come to the mic, we'll have an a, uh, open mic session near the end of the show. At the bottom left-hand corner is a green hand with the, this, I'm really having a hard time, there's a hand with a green arrow. If you click on that, a number will appear in front of your name and then we will know that you want to come to the mic, except that there's a little bit of a, a caveat with this. Please have a USB headset on. If you don't, we're going to get feedback off you and uh, if we don't seem to get your audio right away, please just be happy to type your question in the, ch in the chat area and uh, we'll be able to get that answer for you. And so the chat area, I think, Many of you have found this in the bottom of the participants window. There's this blank field. You can type your message in here, click send, and the message will go to the entire room if it is checked as this room. If you've come in and it says moderator, it says someone's name, the drop down arrow here on the right, you'll be able to scroll up and down and find this room so that we can all hear you. If you do come to the mic, Here's your access to the microphone. It's that little microphone in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. If it's active, it'll become yellow, and you'll be able to speak. Turn it off when you're finished. Uh, we do have whiteboard tools. In a minute, I'm going to ask to use this specific one here. Right on the side of your whiteboard is a blue, little blue wand with a starburst on the end. We're going to ask you to help us find, show where you are in the world on our world map. Bill is going to be doing some application sharing today. So I'd like to suggest that you do this now, and I know, of course, this is a Mac um, diagram, but it's the same idea. If you go to Tools, Application Scaring, Sharing, and Scale to Fit, that will help you see a full uh, rendering of the application being shared. So just take a second now to go to Tools, Application Sharing, and Scale to Fit, because I know it will be a better experience for you. Just give me a second while you do that. And I'll move on to remind you, especially for the new people, uh, you see all kinds of conversation going by and you miss it or you see a link dropped in and you miss it, don't worry. We post our recordings for our show as the full Illuminate session, as the chat log for the show, an MP3, MP3 file for audio and an MP4. A file that you can embed anywhere you like on a website or a blog so that you can have encourage people to share this information. And we post it all on our website at live.classroom20.com in the archives and resources page. So please don't forget to access the recordings at the end of the show and pass it on to anyone that you know who might have missed the show and would be um, blessed by the information that Bill is going to share with us today. So, Kim's given you whiteboard tools, and we're now going to move on to the world map. So this is the time for you to go to this blue wand with the red starburst. And over here on the map, click where you are in the world. I know we're going to have somebody over here because Shambles is here. People in India, 
We've got in West Africa. No, am I making a mistake? Okay, France, Portugal, Spain here. We have BC. Thank you. Nice to have more connects with me. I don't feel too lonely because there's a lot of people here in the United States. But we are always so thankful that we have a visual that really identifies the outreach that our show does have because we have people all over the globe joining us. So if I missed you where you're living, go ahead, type where you are in the chat room so we can have benefit if I can't find you on the map. Next challenge now is going to be poll questions. So remember under the participants window, green check and red X? I'd like you to do that now. Answer our first poll question if you wouldn't mind. Do your students collaborate using wikis for their projects? So it's a green check if they do and a red X if you don't. And I'll show you the results of our poll in a minute. We're just waiting now for everyone to take a chance to cast their vote. So look at the bottom of the participants window for the green check or the red X. And obviously, if you don't have students in the classroom, you can't answer that question. I'm going to show you the results here. There, 40% do, 42% don't. So we're about 50-50 in outreach here, Bill. So you're going to have enough great opportunity to test and provide more information to those 40% that don't. I'm going to clear the results now. Thank you very much. Kim did that for me. Next question. Are you familiar with Kiva.org? I'm just waiting for the votes now. Great, we have just about everybody voting here. So um, almost 65% are not familiar with it. So I know you're going to appreciate uh, getting a, a upfront close uh, sharing of Kiva.org. Thank you very much for clearing the votes and go to our last poll question, which is do you teach your students about Creative Commons licensing for using images or music in their projects? It looks like to me about 50-50 we're getting those votes. Let's see if I'm right. So if you not cast your vote, it's a green check if you are teaching Creative Commons licensing, red X if you're not. So 45% of the participants today do. And I think it's around 37% don't do that. So we'll have a, a great discussion near the end as to why or why not to do that. Bill, it's going to give you a, a good sense of how the show is going to go today. So um, thank you very much, everyone, for participating in the poll questions. I want to go on to uh, give you some uh, background information on Bill. And then I'm going to turn the microphone over to Bill in just a minute. Uh, physically, I haven't met Bill, but I know I followed him for a long time as Plug Us In on Twitter. And I know that uh, Bill is a sixth grade teacher in a professional learning community named Raleigh, North Carolina. We just talked about the fact that he used to live up here close to me in, in Canada. And how jealous I am the fact that he's in a warm environment right now. But uh, Bill is a National Board Certified Teacher and he's designed professional development courses for educators nationwide. His training includes how to use blogs, wikis, podcasts in the classroom, and the role of iTunes in teaching and learning, and the power of digital movie making. Bill has also developed school-wide technology rubrics and surveys that identify student and staff digital proficiency at the building level. He's the founding member and senior fellow of the Teacher Leaders Network, and he has served as a teacher and resident at the Center for Teaching Quality. And I know that Bill has a longer list of credentials that I hope that he'll share with us as he introduces himself as well. Uh, Bill, again, we're so happy that you could be with us today. I'm looking forward to this presentation. I know everyone else is. We're going to ask you to take that mic. And if you could, we have a newbie question. Who is the I generation? So over to you, Bill. It's a really interesting question if you think about it. Um, you know, you've got people that ask all the time about the I generation and what are our students actually like. And I've put together a couple of definitions, or at least I've kind of thought through the definitions of who are our students today. And, and more importantly, how are they different than our students from yesterday? And I started off with this slide. I, I really think that our I generation students are almost always plugged in, aren't they? 
I mean, these are kids that have devices galore. I mean, their earbuds hang out of their backpacks. They can't help but pull their cell phones out at every other, at every opportunity. You know, they go home and they network with each other, playing rock band on their, on their, um, on their. Uh, computer devices, you know, their PlayStations. And I think that's cool. I mean, that's something that's unique about them for sure. But I want to make sure that you understand that plugged in doesn't just mean plugged into devices. Plugged in also means to networks as well. Uh, you know, if you go and check out any of the Pew research, it talks about how our students are checking their Facebook pages dozens and dozens and dozens of times every day. Uh, our students are, are instant messaging with each other as comfortably as they are um, uh, conversing with each other in any other way. Uh, they, they watch television programs together in the instant message. They've got windows open constantly. And I think that's interesting. The hitch about that is that doesn't always make them better students. Just because you're plugged into devices and just because you're plugged into a network doesn't mean that you necessarily know how to use those devices or use those networks in a meaningful way. And I think if you spend any time watching your students in class over the last decade or so, probably the thing that you notice the most is that they don't always think as deeply as you'd like them to. Uh, I, the term for that is info snacking. I think it actually ended up in the dictionary a couple of years ago as one of the, the most recent words to be adopted. But info snacking essentially means flitting your way from instant experience to instant experience. And I know that when I watch my students, you know, I teach sixth graders, and when I watch my students in class, that's kind of how they do everything. Um, and I think it's both an advantage for students to be able to have access to content so quickly and so readily, but I also think it's a disadvantage because it means that they navigate away from deep thinking as soon as stuff gets challenging. I, I know that that's the frustration that Mark Bauerlein expresses about our students today. Uh, if you don't know Mark Bauerlein, uh, Mark Bauerlein wrote a book a couple of years ago called uh, The Dumbest Generation. And he was basically talking about how our students today have these incredible opportunities, right? They, they, they have access to so much more information and so many more chances than kids a decade ago that they should be outperforming students of a decade ago. But if you look at pretty much any academic metric, they really aren't. And that's why he calls them the dumbest generation. It's a group of kids with an opportunity that aren't taking advantage of it, or with lots of potential, um, but they're not taking advantage of that. Uh, he actually calls us teachers, those of us who push the web 2.0 um, windows in our schools, he calls us the ever optimistic techno cheerleaders, which I don't know is, um, is necessarily a term of endearment. But for me, the thing that's important to understand is that as long as we're willing to pair what we know about good teaching with what our students know about good tools, they truly can be something more. They can think deeply. They can get involved in social issues. They can collaborate on levels that they've never been able to collaborate on before. You know, a part of helping kids take advantage of opportunity and to reach their potential is pairing what we know about good teaching and learning with what they know about good tools. Now, there's something that I need to say about tools before I go any further in my presentation, it's, and it's that there's nothing magical about tools. You know, I saw this iPad ad not long ago. I forget where I saw it. Maybe it was on Flickr. And it's really interesting because if you read the, the caption, it describes the iPad as this magical and revolutionary product. And we always talk about digital tools as magical and revolutionary products, don't we? First it was the whiteboard, you know, then it was sets of student responders, and now it's the iPad. It's some kind of, you know, gizmo that's going to save education. But that's just not true. Real magic rests in the minds, of hearts, the minds and hearts of teachers that are using digital tools to introduce their students to new individuals, ideas, and opportunities. I mean, like in the end, we're the magic because we understand what good teaching looks like and we can help kids to use new tools to make their learning more efficient. And if we're able to do that, then true student achievement is the result, right? I mean, that's how we make a difference in the lives of our kids. I think sometimes we miss that. Sometimes we put tools first in the conversation about teaching and learning with technology. And that's a real shame because in the end, the magic is us. Uh, tools can help, but in the end, the magic is us. Uh, now, during the course of my comments today, what I wanted to do is I wanted to show you sort of how I plan lessons with technology. Uh, and those always start with curriculum. You know, it always starts with what am I supposed to teach my kids? What do my kids need to learn?
And w one of the examples of that is in, in my state, here in North Carolina, uh, in our language arts curriculum, we're supposed to focus on persuasion. The art of verbal persuasion, the art of written persuasion, uh, the idea of solving problems, like problem solution essays are big, evaluation essays are big, and those kinds of things uh, are so important in our state that they're tested in seventh grade. It's, an, it's a gateway exam in seventh grade. If our students can't develop a solid persuasive essay, then, then they're not supposed to be promoted to the next grade level. Uh, we all know that that doesn't always happen in practice. But theoretically, our kids are supposed to fail if they can't craft a persuasive essay. And as a result, in sixth grade, we spend a, an awful lot of time developing those persuasive writing skills in, a, in our classes. Our students are um, encouraged to write persuasive essays constantly. And in the beginning of my work with sixth graders in language arts, we always wrote the, the typical persuasive essays. Should schools have uniforms? Uh, how can we fight against bullying? Those, those topics that are sort of timeless, that motivate our kids, but that are completely unconnected to the curriculum. And so what we decided to do is we decided to connect our persuasive essays to uh, our science curriculum, and we focused on alternative energy. You know, the idea was, what other energy sources should we pursue in the United States, as opposed to our over-reliance on coal or, or other fossil fuels? And we thought that was pretty revolutionary in and of itself, because at least we were connecting what we were doing to the science curriculum. The problem was, is the product was still really traditional, in the sense that our kids wrote five paragraph essays. And they were good, and they were focused on content, but there wasn't anything really magical about it. And so what I decided to do, and this was a couple of years back, I decided to move our alternative energy essays to a wiki. And the purpose behind it in my own thinking was, first of all, to give my kids a chance to co-create content. I decided that my students weren't going to create an essay on their own anymore. Instead, I was going to pair them into teams and have them develop a wiki page introducing their topic to one another and crafting it and developing it in groups of five. I, I just I thought that that co-creation was important. Learning how to create with one another is a is kind of a new literacy. It's a skill that matters in the business world today. But for me, the biggest reason that I switched our project to a wiki was because I knew that by writing on a wiki, I was able to give my kids a greater audience for what we were doing. And you know that sense of even when you're 11, you can have an audience. That's a lesson I think our kids need to learn. I mean, spend a little bit of time paying attention to what's happening in Egypt, and you can recognize that people seized control of their country because they recognized that they could communicate and organize with each other in a non-traditional way. I want my kids to learn that lesson. I want my kids to realize that they can use digital tools to share messages and to influence ideas, even though they're 11. And let me just go ahead and take you to my wiki. I'm going to go and grab it and, and pull up our um, pull up the web tour option so that you can kind of see what I was doing. I imagine that, that most of you probably have gone and clicked on it and you're poking around anyways. But we'll rock a little web tour here so that you can, uh, that you can see what we're talking about. Uh, again, it's just a really simple wiki. You know, the, uh, the opening explains what the purpose of our project is. And we crafted our essays in the format of a letter to the governor of our state. And what I explained to our students is, OK, so let's say the governor never reads our letters. Are our letters worthwhile online anyways? And we had the conversation about the fact that once we start to create content on the web, even if the governor doesn't read our letters, even if he chooses to ignore us, other people really can't and really won't. We're helping to elevate conversations about alternative energy without the governor's permission. And that's pretty cool in and of itself. You know, that's a way that you can empower your kids to see themselves as social agents, which I think is fun. Um, I'll just go ahead and click through on one of my student projects and pull up one of my, my kids' essays. You can see that each page was um, dedicated to one group of students. Those groups typically had five students in them. And the job of that group was to craft a page uh, that was written in the format of a letter to the governor and that explained what alternative energy sources that my students thought uh, they should pursue, that our state should pursue. What I liked about the project is, especially on this page, if you take a look at it, you can see how many links my students inserted in this particular document, right? 
This gave me the opportunity to talk with my kids about the fact that when you're writing online, one of the ways that you can tell or judge the reliability of a source is how many links it has in it. And then more importantly, what are the quality of those links? So this project gave me the opportunity to sort of talk about the reliability of online sources, which I thought was pretty neat. Uh, my students were broken into groups of five. And you can see some conversation down here in the comment section between those groups of five. Sometimes I chime in, and you can see my name there. And other times, you can see my students talking with each other about what are we going to do? And, and, and whose job is it to do what? Um, uh, down here in this particular section, you see them calling themselves Flowmaster and Link Layer, right? This is my favorite group name. Hey, Art and Fart. Right? Those are all specific roles that I gave to my students. One of the things that I found with wiki projects is that if you just turn students loose on a wiki project and expect them to co-create content on their own, you're going to get a couple of kids who do all the work, and you're going to get a couple of kids who don't do anything. Right? It's kind of how group projects seem to go. And while that's OK on an adult wiki like Wikipedia, when you're a teacher and you're trying to assess student learning, that kind of uneven distribution of student work doesn't, um, doesn't really fly. And so what I did is I created roles. And they're right here. And each group had to have a link layer whose job was to go and find links that supported the content that their group was writing about. Each group had to have a flow master. And a flow master's job was supposed to um, actually be in charge of the, the evaluation of the writing on the particular page. How could they improve their language? The discussion starter's job was to work in the discussion board or the comment section of the wiki page. And they were supposed to um, help their group to move forward, like to look at their page and evaluate what needed to be done next, and then to write about that in the discussion starters or in the comment section of the wiki page. Uh, we had somebody called Captain Spit and Polish. And the kids started to call that the queen of art and fart, too. And the spit and polish and art and fart, their job was to uh, make sure that they added visually appealing content to a web page. You know, we had the chance to talk about when somebody lands on your page and they see a page that's sort of scattered or it's untidy or there isn't any visual elements, they're going to walk away. So you won't be able to be as influential. Now, you got to remember, I'm teaching middle schoolers. So when you start to call them spit and polish and art and fart, they just think it's hilarious. So I really wanted to recommend that when you work on a, on a wiki page, that you give your kids very specific roles to fill. I mean, those are the kinds of things, like if we as adults sat down to create a wiki page together, we would do these things naturally. You know, people would jump on those tasks naturally. Your students aren't going to be able to do those things naturally just because those aren't behaviors that they've learned before. So by structuring very clear roles for your kids, not only can you assess them in a more meaningful way, not only can you, can you fairly determine who did what, when you're trying to give a grade on a particular project. But you can also um, you can show your kids the kind of behaviors that, that we all expect when, we have, um, when we're working on collaborative projects. Does that, does that make sense to you? And so essentially, just, just remember that. I mean, I, I want to emphasize one more time that, that there's nothing really special about my wiki project, right? I mean, in the end, it's still a five paragraph essay. The difference is, is that it was a five paragraph essay that was developed collaboratively, which is a skill that I think kids need to learn. And it was also a five paragraph essay that gave the kids a larger audience for their work. And we were able to talk about the idea that you, know, you can be influential just by elevating conversations. Okay. Does anybody have a question about my wiki project? You can, you can leave it in the comment section if you want to. And I'll see if I can um, answer your questions about either wikis or this particular project before moving on. Yeah, there was a couple questions there for you. One of them was from Michelle. How often do you have access to computers? And then Maureen asked, uh, do you assign roles to play to individual strengths or to challenge them or both? Those are, those are great questions. And I, and I see there's another similar question about access. Um, this, is, this is awesome. I teach in a, in a relatively affluent suburban community outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. I mean, we're in the Research Triangle Park. So this is like Tech Central. And I have one working computer in my classroom that's connected to the internet. And, uh, and we have two computer labs. However, um, those computer labs are booked 
all the time. I mean, they're booked really frequently. It's difficult to get in. Now, many of my students have access outside of, of school, but not all do. And I did a similar project with technology working in a high poverty school here in the Raleigh area. And I did a survey of my kids after the project was over and asked, you know, like, was this difficult for you? Like, were you able to find a way to get online? Do you have a way that you know how to get online? Like, when you need to get online, what do you do? And I found that over 88% of my kids had a solution when it came to getting online. And the project was motivating enough to them that they made the opportunity to get online. Uh, one of my favorite kids of all time was the student that didn't have internet access at home. But he was in my digital projects constantly. And to the point where when he was in ISS, he would sign into our, uh, that's in school suspension, he would sign into our digital projects, particularly our conversations, and he would share. So there was a level of motivation for students to get, get involved in these projects, and, and they made it happen most of the time. That being said, at school, the option that, that I always gave to students was we have a, what's called a working lunch period. My students could come up and work in our classrooms, or they could go to the library during lunch if they needed to work on something, or they could come up before school. Our students tend to arrive about a half hour before the day starts. So access wasn't really a problem. As far as assigning specific roles to students, um, I actually have, and it's in the technology resources for my book, so you can go and download this if you want to. When I pair students together in a group, I ask them to think about who would be good for which role. Like, I ask them to think about their own personalities. And I have them as a group decide who's going to be the best at which particular job. So they sort of self-identify when they're working on a wiki project. Now, I always tell them that when, you're, when you self-identify, it doesn't mean that I won't come and change your roles. You know, like if I think a particular student is consistently choosing a role that doesn't allow him to practice writing skills that matter, then I, I can go in and change group assignments. Uh, but at the same time, most of the time, I let the kids do that first. You know, we're middle schoolers, so I want them to start to think about what their personality strengths and weaknesses are. And I want them to think about how they can make contributions to a group. I mean, when you talk about co-creation of content, those are important lessons, too. OK, any, any last minute questions, Lorna or Kim? Did you see any questions that I missed? Yes. Um, just asked, how do you get the outsiders to be magical? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. How do I get the outsiders to be magical? So it's outside of your classroom and your campus to be magical and to um, do these great things with their students. Yeah, well, it's a good question. Like, like how do I get other, t yeah, I, I'm assuming that you mean, do I get other teachers? How do, how do we get other teachers to jump onto these kinds of projects? Is that is that what you're asking? Right, because you mentioned that the iPad was um, a magical revolutionary tool. And Jess was asking sure. um, how you get others to be right. those magical tools. Yeah, uh, well, I think, I think if your question is, how do I encourage other teachers to jump onto individual tools? Or like, how do I get teachers to move their own instruction forward? Uh, I put up a post on my blog this week where I was talking about the fact that change in education has to be evolutionary as opposed to revolutionary. You know, we oftentimes, especially as people that are tech innovators, will often want to jump in and get teachers to tackle the most complicated project that they can. We argue that it's time for out-of-the-box thinking. I would personally say, and, and this is supported by Stephen Johnson, uh, who's um, written a great book called Where Do Good Ideas Come From? And uh, I would argue that out-of-the-box thinking isn't rare, is very rarely effective. So what I try to do when I'm getting other teachers involved in technology projects is I try to think about things that they're currently doing. And I try to find ways to enhance those projects or to make those projects more efficient or to make those projects easier with technology. I'll give you a perfect example. The math teacher on my team this year is a great lady, love her to death, um, and she's a fantastic math teacher, but she's not drawn to technology. I mean, that's not her bag of wax. So I've started to experiment with a LiveScribe pen, and I, I don't know if you've ever seen a LiveScribe pen before, but what it will do is it will capture your handwriting and it will capture audio recordings that you're making while you're writing, and it will pair those things together. All you have to use is a, is, a, is a LiveScribe notebook, which looks just like any other notebook you've ever used. 
And so when you think about that, uh, what I've done with my math teachers, I've gotten her to start to create tutorials in this LiveScribe notebook. What that looks like from her is she sits down with a spiral notebook and a pen. And she starts to work through math problems and show kids how to solve math problems. That's something that she's doing already. You know, she does that work every single day in class. And there couldn't be anything less intimidating than a spiral notebook and a pen. But what that spiral notebook and pen then allows her to do is upload the tutorials that she's created. She can design warehouses of remedial lessons and warehouses of enrichment lessons really simply. Do you see how that's not really revolutionary thinking, that's evolutionary thinking? I mean, she's creating digital tutorials, which we think of as evolutionary, but she, or I'm sorry, revolutionary, but she's using a tool that's approachable to her. I think sometimes as tech leaders, we have to understand that when we jump into the let's do out of the box thinking and let's be revolutionary in the work that we do, we sort of scare off some of our colleagues. And that sort of makes um, change a non-starter in the conversation. I hope that I hope that answers. I see um, Paula's question is, what's the cost of a LiveScribe pen? I, I bought a refurbished one on the LiveScribe website for 70 bucks, and it, and it holds 200 hours worth of recording. Uh, you can get all the way up to $179 pens, um, and the $179 pens hold 800 hours of recording. Um, if anybody has the time to stop by my blog, I wrote a, a post just recently called um, Teaching and Learning with LiveScribe Pens. And I would go and grab that for you, but I'm just going to be, um, I, 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 that'll distract me, I think. I have trouble keeping up with the chat box and going over to my blog. All right. Um, I think I'm going to move on. I see there's a lot of life about live scribe pens in the chat box. Uh, if you guys want to talk about those at the end of the conversation, I'm more than willing to. OK? Uh, let me move on to my next project that I wanted to show you, because I think this is the one out of all of my projects that I'm the most proud of. Uh, in our middle school curriculum, our social studies students are supposed to study the differences between developed and developing nations. And specifically, they're supposed to find the connections between like the kind of government that a country has and the quality of life indicators that they have. So we study things like what's the GDP per capita in a country that is um, a democracy versus what's the GDP per capita in a country that's an oligarchy, those kinds of questions. Um, we look at things like what is the cost of living in a country versus the educational development of people, like, like the, the, the level of education that they attain. We look at things like what's the infant mortality rate in countries where the GDP per capita is low. Uh, we're also responsible for studying um, South America. That's one of the main reasons or regions that we're responsible for looking at. And at our school, the, the way that we always tackled this traditionally was to do a country study. And it was a very traditional project. You know, it was we would uh, have the kids go to the library and, and they would be assigned a particular country and they would look, use the internet and use uh, our media center's collection of resources in order to collect data about the country they were assigned. And then they would develop a PowerPoint presentation and come back and, and deliver it in class. And I guess there's nothing really wrong with that project. You know, I mean, that's not exactly um, a, a bad instruction. But at the same time, in 2008, I stumbled across Kiva. And I stumbled across Kiva from Carl Fish, who is um, a, a tweet guy from Colorado that I tend to follow all the time. And Carl was setting up a, a Kiva group for teachers, for our PLN. He called it Team Shift Happens. And what Kiva allows you to do is Kiva allows people in the developed world to make loans to entrepreneurs in the developing world. So right now, if you wanted to, you could take 25 of your dollars and loan it to somebody in Africa, or loan it to somebody in Malaysia, or loan it to somebody in South America who was trying to start a business, somebody in a developing country that was trying to start a business. And what I thought was, how powerful would it be if my students started to study the countries of South America through the lens of people that they wanted to loan to? Like, what if they took the time to study a country where there was an entrepreneur that caught their eye and made lending decisions based on the kind of country or the statistics that they gathered about a particular country? That, that to me, seemed like it, it was going to be a, a more powerful way to study a country. It was going to be a real, more real way to study a country. I mean, I don't think it can get any more real than making a loan to a person in, a de in the developing world. 
Um, and most importantly, Kiva gave me a chance to get my kids involved in social action. You know, as a middle school teacher, when you can tap into social action, that's super motivating and powerful. Our kids are still driven by fairness. You know, they're still driven by the idea of justice and injustice. So here's a way that we could look at parts of the world and talk about social justice through the lens of people that were making $1,000 a year or people that were making $200 a year and just needed a little bit of money to start a business. It just seemed like a more powerful way to introduce my kids to a part of the world that we were responsible for studying anyways. Now, I'm going to go and do some desktop sharing now, and I'll show you where our Kiva work is. Like, I'll show you what Kiva looks like, and we can talk for a minute about the kinds of loans that my kids have made and the lessons that they've learned through making those loans. Now, desktop sharing, there's a bit of a delay, so hopefully, and I talk fast already, so hopefully you won't um, be too far behind me in the uh, in my presentation. I'll, I'll do my best to sort of slow down while I'm speaking. So Kiva is easy to find. I'm going to actually log out here so that you can see the Kiva main page. Kiva is easy to find. It's just kiva.org. And this type of lending is called micro lending. There are more than one micro lending site that sites out there that you can use. Uh, but this is the one that I just kind of happened to stumble across, and I really like it. Now, when I click log in and enter my email and, and password, whoa, geez, just wish I could uh, keep my fingers in the right spot right now. It's a miracle I remember my password. <laughs> there it goes, I didn't remember it. Anybody else struggle with password remembering? I certainly do. Now, when I sign in, it's going gonna, it's gonna to land me right now on my classes Kiva homepage. And I'm, I'm actually remarkably proud of my kids. I get chills every time that I have a chance to show this to people. Because if you look right here in the middle of the screen, my students in the last, it's probably been two years since we've been Kiva lending, have loaned, made 160 loans. That means that we've loaned out money to 160 different entrepreneurs in the world. Uh, we've loaned out, if, if I had the total number, actually I think I can get it if I go here and click on see all. I think we've loaned out just under or just over $5,000 to entrepreneurs in the developing world. Actually, that's really cool. Check this out. Uh, we're at $6,000 right now to entrepreneurs all over the world. And as we scroll down, you can see ho who those entrepreneurs are. I mean, these are people that we've made loans to. And some of them are people who've paid us back already and other people we've just loaned to. My kids picked um, Shema here the other day in the country of Iraq. Uh, and they loaned to her. This was the loan we made on Wednesday, actually. And what my kids do when they land on a particular person is they do all kinds of studying about that person and that country to decide whether this is someone they want to loan to. They usually start by reading this information because they can find out information about the terms of the loan. They don't ever like to go over a loan that we're not going to get paid back. They don't like to see a repayment term longer than 14 months. And they don't like that because it means that they're not going to get the money back anytime soon to loan out again. They also oftentimes will check whether or not we're going to get our loans paid back monthly. That's something that my kids care about because it means that we'll get a little bit of money back every single month which we can then turn around and loan back out again. They always love to read this information about the borrower, and they particularly like to look for women with children to loan to. And you can see that that's the case here. We've got a 32-year-old woman with four children. The reason they like to loan to women with children is because Kiva's done studies on the impact of microlending. And when you loan to a woman, you're more likely to help out her entire village than when you loan to a man because women tend to stay with their villages longer, their towns longer than men do. So my kids look for that. They pay attention to those things when they're deciding who to loan to. They're constantly fascinated by what people want to buy. You know, in this particular case, the lady's trying to buy a sewing machine and a generator. That creates really interesting opportunities for conversations about this region of the world. Like, why would somebody need a generator? Our kids don't even think about that. And remember, my social studies objective is what's the difference between the developed and the developing world. Uh, we regularly make loans to people who are investing in agriculture. Like we helped a woman buy a pig the other day. 
that blows my kids' minds. I mean, the fact that there are people who are still surviving kind of on agriculture or agriculture-based businesses, very small agricultural businesses, just blows my little suburban kids' minds. Like, they don't even, they don't even really know where the bacon in the store comes from, right? So it becomes a really interesting opportunity to talk about different parts of the world. Then my kids will come over to this section, and they'll start to study the field partners. And what the field partner is, is basically the bank that's managing our money. Like, this is the bank that's responsible for um, dispersing our cash and for recollecting our cash. And my kids love looking at this information because this is their money that they're, that they're lending out. You know, they're concerned about losing their cash. So they check to see whether it's a four-star bank or a five-star bank. They check to see down here what the delinquency rate of the bank is, and they look at the default rate. Sometimes when they're super motivated, they'll click on this button, which talks about more on the field partner, and they can find out what the interest rate that the bank is charging is. You should see, uh, the other day, there, the, the Kiva started making loans to Sudan for the first time. And my kids wanted to make a loan to Sudan because they had studied in seventh grade. They had studied all about the genocide occurring in the Sudan. And when we clicked on to learn more about the interest rate that the bank was charging, it was 88%. What an amazing lesson to talk to kids about from a financial literacy standpoint. You know, you've got a bank charging 88% interest. Is that a bank that we want to support? Why would they charge such a high interest rate? Would we tolerate that in the United States? Why does it make sense for a bank in the developing world? So there's financial literacy lessons that go into it, too. And then my kids will almost always come down here and poke through the information about the country. And they're consistently blown away by what the average annual income is in other places. If you click on this link, it'll give you more information about life expectancies and infant mortalities. Now, I want you to think about that. Remember what my original lesson was all about. I mean, originally, my job was to teach kids about, um, to teach kids about um, the developing world, right? We were studying South America. We did a PowerPoint presentation where kids read out of a book. That's all legitimate stuff. I mean, that's not bad teaching. But how much more powerful is it when my students are studying parts of the world because they care about making a loan to somebody who's trying to start a business. That's a heck of a lot more um, exciting, motivating, interesting. It's, it's more practical. It's real. Um, and, it, and, it, and it forces my kids, or it taps into my kids' desire to study justice and fairness, which I think is cool. Um, I took this whole series of lessons even further, and I tied it back to persuasion again. Remember that first objective I showed you? Uh, my kids have to write persuasive essays. They have to write evaluation essays. We always wrote evaluation essays on, like, what's your favorite book and why? That, you know, that used to be our evaluation essay. Now my evaluation essays are, which person should we choose to loan to and why? I mean, it's the same skill. You're writing, about persua you're writing persuasive essays. But you're writing persuasive essays about a person that you want to loan to, and you have to study all of these criteria about the country that you want to make a loan to, and you have to study all of these criteria about the, um, about the bank that's responsible for your cash. I just think that's awesome. That blows me away. And the kids are a whole heck of a lot more motivated um, to work on that stuff. If you look right in here in the middle of the page, and I'm not going to take you there, I don't know if this little wand will leave a red dot, but I'll go ahead and leave it for you. Um, there is a link to a bunch of resources that you can find that I've developed for doing all of this kind of persuasive work with Kiva. And there's just handouts galore. I mean, stuff that I've used with my Kiva clubs and stuff that I've used with my language arts classes. If you're interested in this kind of thing, go and download them because I think they'll be helpful to you. All right, so um, Lorna or Kim, did you see any questions in the sidebar that I should address right now? I've got one more project that I wanted to show, but I'm, I'm more, than, uh, more than motivated to answer questions about Kiva. It's something I care about. Sweet. Thanks, Kim. Um, by the way, oh, Pam Moran says, any questions from parents about the use of Kiva? No, um, the, our parents love Kiva. Uh, they think it is the, one of the most uh, remarkable projects that we do um, because they want their kids to be socially aware, too. I mean, the, the majority of our parents want their kids to be caring and, and to recognize that we've got privileges in the United States that people in other places don't.
Interestingly enough, Pam, and I think this is um, something that you could relate to, the biggest challenge that I've had was um, finding ways to deal with raising money um, for our Kiva project that didn't violate schools, the school's um, fundraising and accounting procedures. You know, our district has some really strict rules about how many fundraisers can you have and how is that money documented and where does that money go and that was by far the, the biggest challenge that I had was finding ways to make Kiva fit within all, all those rules. Now the one thing I'll say about fundraising is the best part about Kiva is that everything is a loan. I mean, the, the money that we um, send out all around the world is a loan and that means we get it back. So you have to fundraise one time. And once you fundraise one time, Kiva becomes a self-sustaining project. Uh, by the way, one more plug for Kiva. Um, my students, at the very end of last year, we were making our 100th loan. And they said, Mr. Ferrer, can we do something big for our 100th loan? Can we fund an entire loan? Usually, we can't afford to fund an entire loan. We only fund part of a loan. And they wanted to do the entire thing. And so we found this guy in Uganda. And he was trying to rebuild his home. He had five children. He had been divorced. I think it said his wife had left him or something like that. And he was trying to fix up his home for his kids. Now, I got to tell you, my 12-year-olds my in my classroom, that, that really pulled at their heartstrings. To think about other kids who don't have a solid home to live in was sort of heartbreaking to them. So they were like, Miss Ferry, can we just loan everything to this guy? He wanted $500 to, to fix up his house. And so we did. It was our 100th loan, and we loaned 500 bucks to the guy. And he was supposed to pay back monthly, and so we didn't feel uncomfortable about it. We've never lost any money in Kiva ever. And so we didn't feel uncomfortable about it. And then in August, when the kids came back to school, two of my boys crashed in the door. They're, they're now eighth graders. And they crashed in the door, and they said, Mr. Ferreter, that guy that we loaned $500 to, he's in default. We're not going to get our money back. What are we going to do? And sure enough, I went and I checked out the Kiva website, and it turns out that the bank, the partner bank that um, Kiva was using, had their, their work had been frozen. There were some questions about whether they were legitimate, and there was a very real chance we were going to lose our cash. And talk about a cool lesson for my kids to learn. You know, I mean, that's all financial literacy. Um, the good news is we got our money back. I, I don't know how it happened, but I thought that was great. So, all right, now I'm going to move on and I'm going to show you one other thing that we did that's connected to Kiva and persuasion. Another um, key part of our curriculum is to talk about um, the ethical use of digital content. Um, specifically, that kids are supposed to study how you can use digital images and music fairly. And that typically falls on the classroom teacher. I mean, I think it's the, officially the curriculum is a part of the curriculum delivered by media specialists. But in middle school, we don't have a heck of a lot of time with our media specialists. So uh, most of the time, classroom teachers take over those responsibilities. And it's kind of done poorly. I mean, and I can even admit that I've done it poorly for years. Um, you know, our kids will go just like any other kid. They'll go to Google when they need images, and they'll do a Google image search, and they'll save whatever they find. And, uh, and from there, they think they've done what they need to do. And as teachers, we'll usually encourage our kids to um, put a link to all of the pictures that they've used. And we kind of think of that as fair use. OK, well, we used a picture. I'm sorry, I scrolled too far ahead. Um, we'll find a picture, we'll put a link to it, and we'll think, OK, that's enough. That's all that we need to do. In reality, there's so much more to um, using images fairly. And the idea of, of copyright and creative commons and attribution of sources is just, I mean, it's changing dramatically. And it's changing incredibly quickly. Uh, if you haven't done any research about creative commons before, you really ought to. Creative commons is a new type of copyright basically. And it was designed by people who wanted to freely share their content. And people who use Creative Commons licenses basically give you permission in advance to use their work. Now, it's a little more complicated than that in the sense that there are rules. I mean, sometimes they'll, they will allow you to use their work, but you can't change it. Sometimes you can use their work, but it has to be for non-business um, non, um, purposes. Uh, sometimes you can use their work, but you have to make sure that you cite in a, in a specific way um, where you got the original content from. But essentially, it's a new type of copyright that's designed to encourage people to use content. And so I teach my kids all about the Creative Commons, and we do that through Kiva Club. 
Um, what we've done is we've created a video advertising the work of our Kiva Club. And I think I'm going to use the web tour just to show you a minute or two of that. I won't be able to show you the whole thing uh, simply because it's a little bit longer than we have time for. Uh, but I'll go to the web tour and I'll show you just a minute or two of it. And I want you to remember that my kids created this. They went and they found Creative Commons images um, that supported the idea of global poverty. And then they used Animoto to put it together into a short video. Uh, if you've never used Animoto before, it's a ridiculously easy service to create movies with. Uh, for me, the purpose was, let's go find some Creative Commons images to create an influential video. Uh, it looks like Kim has mentioned that everybody has to click play on the web tour window. So maybe let me go to application sharing again, and, uh, and I can show it to you that way. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if I click play on application sharing, you'll all see it automatically. Sorry about the confusion. Sorry about that. It looks like people uh, don't have sound in application sharing, so that's, um, that's a bit of a bummer. Uh, anyways, you can certainly go and check out the video yourself. It's uh, right here is the address in the middle of the screen. And basically what you'll see is a series of images that represent poverty that we took from Creative Commons warehouses, particularly Flickr's Creative Commons warehouse. And we assembled them along with some um, influential statistics about poverty around the world. And our goal was to try to design people to get behind our Kiva project. And it's neat because it's sort of a, a whole assembly of everything we've talked about. I mean, my kids were studying poverty and the developed in the developing world. That's a social studies objective. They were studying um, persuasion, visual, visual persuasion in particular. How do you use images and music to sway people? That's a language arts objective. And we were studying how to use Creative Commons images fairly which is uh, like a computer technical objective that's a part of our curriculum. Again, go all the way back to the beginning of my presentation. You know, I in the end, it's about the teaching and it's about the objectives. And all that technology allows you to do is to teach those objectives in a more efficient way. I hope that makes sense. Uh, I'm going to turn my attention back to the chat box. Kim and Lorna, maybe you've seen some questions that I can answer. I know that we're running out of time. The questions I saw you had already addressed, um, but one of them that I saw recently was, are there any school or district regulations um, related to fundraising or donating to Kiva? Uh, there, there are an awful lot of regulations in, in most districts, and so you're going to have to get up with your probably your school's budget lady or your school's accountant and you're going to have to find, um, find out what those rules and regulations are. Now, that being said, I got a bit assertive with our school. And it was easy for me to do because I took all of my materials to them and I said, look at what my kids are doing. More importantly, I said, come and talk to my kids. And I want you to tell me that I'm not addressing the standards in our curriculum. And I want you to tell me that I'm not addressing those standards in a, in a legitimate, engaging, and motivating way. I think that if you were to run into resistance, especially around the idea of using Kiva as a way to introduce your students to social studies objectives and to language arts objectives, all it would take was a couple of, um, a couple of conversations to show people that it was worthwhile and I'll bet you could get some rules changed. Uh, I'm lucky in the sense that I work with a, a pretty progressive uh, principal and a pretty progressive district that was willing to let me experiment with it. And, uh, and I think that's fantastic. I'm thankful for that. But at the same time, I think even if I didn't, I could be persuasive. Um, I mean, I think the content that my kids are creating, the work that they're doing stands for itself. And it would be difficult to argue that I'm not meeting objectives in an interesting way. And do you know if the kids 
participate in Cuba once they uh, moved on to high school? It's a great question. You have no ideas how you have no idea how many emails I get from my kids who go to high, high school, and they'll say, "We're trying to start a Cuba club. Um, what do we do?" And usually my answer is, "Well, you're going to have to get uh, a faculty sponsor in touch with me so that I can, you know, help them think through the hurdles they're going to have to jump." Uh, the biggest hurdle is, you know, how do you get by the fundraising rules in your particular district? So, yeah, the answer to your question is yes. And I think that's neat. I even had a kid contact me the other day and said, my school doesn't have a Kiva club, Ms. Ferreter, and but I want to do it myself. How do I go about doing it? You know, like, what do I do first? And, uh, and I think that's awesome. I, I just saw Natalie, you asked a question. Um, uh, are you nervous about making a bad investment? Any advice for beginners? Yeah, um, the, the best advice I can give you is that if you go and look at the Kiva website carefully, you're going to find that well over 98% of all loans are paid back and paid back on time. That's an interesting lesson in, in and of itself, isn't it? Here you've got people in the developing world who have nothing, but when you give them a loan, they're going to pay you back. That's fun. I mean, like you can talk to the kids about default rates in the United States. And, and they don't even come close to the default rates that you see in, in, in the developing world or through Kiva. And, and so the first advice I'd give you is don't be too worried about losing money. I don't think it will happen. But if it did happen, my resources, if you go and look at the, um, the micro lending resources that I've shared in the course of the presentation, uh, I have very structured specific rubrics that encourage the kids to look at factors that are connected to the individual to the country and to the bank. And if your kids use that rubric when they're determining their loans, they're going to rarely make a bad investment. And the rubric itself is almost like a checklist. It's like a step-by-step, -step, here's the things to look for. So if you're concerned about it, make sure that you go and you check to, um, to look at that rubric and get your kids to use that rubric. It'll protect you. And, and how, uh, young, how young of students uh, do you recommend that apply in Akiva fundraisers with? Uh, I, I would do it with any age. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, you know, my kid, well, first of all, my kids are sixth graders. Um, but I, I don't think that the idea of, of here are some people that live in a different part of the world that are really, really poor. How does, how does that compare to your life? I don't think that's an age-limited question. I mean, I think you can get more sophisticated with the causes of poverty and the role that we should play in addressing poverty. I think those conversations become more sophisticated as kids get older. But I wouldn't say that there's any young, um, there's any grade level that's too young. I saw somebody ask me whether or not um, my rubric was published or is it a part of Kiva. Uh, my rubric is my rubric. It's in my tech book, which is Teaching the I Generation. Um, and you can also download it for free on um, both my um, professional development wiki, which I think somebody shared along the way, and on my book's product page. Um, I really do. I want to take the chance to plug my book really quickly, not because, um, not, well, not because I'm shilling my book, but mostly because if you go to the product page, even if you don't buy the book, you can find um, over 70 handouts that can help you to teach an awful lot of things in your class. Uh, you know, it's hard for me to be a published writer because I'm kind of an open source guy. I want to share as much as I can, f as freely as I can. And if you go and check out my resources, even if you don't buy the book, there's a lot of stuff there that you can use for free. Um, and I've even created a bunch of tutorials about how to use things too. So be sure you get to that product page or be sure you get to my wiki and steal as much stuff as you can before my publisher figures out I'm giving it away for free. <laughs> See a question about how often does Kiva Club meet? Uh, our Kiva Club meets every other week right now. Um, but I do a lot of Kiva work with my regular students too. Um, so in my classroom, there will be days where I'll say, hey guys, want to make a Kiva loan today? And we'll just pull Kiva up and we'll talk our way through a loan and we'll compare a couple of different loans and make a decision with each other. Um, my kids after school have the opportunity to spend a little bit more time thinking about it. See, there's a question, so I'll go ahead and wait. Good morning, Bill, or good afternoon. How are you? I'm great. Okay. Um, there's been a lot of uh, chat in the window about whether your Kiva club would be interesting in Skyping with some of us 
who are interested in getting started to answer questions about how to start. And also, are there U.S. Um, sponsorships available for Kiva? Both, both great questions. The answer to your first question about whether we're willing to Skype is absolutely. Uh, we are doing that for the first time. What my students have presented to teachers before, but never to kids. And we're doing that for the first time with Lynn Hilt's um, student council. She's an elementary principal, I think, in New Jersey, I want to say. But I'm not 100% positive. And that's on February 23rd. So we will be experienced and a little bit more polished after that. But we'd be happy to Skype with your classes, too. Um, one of the things that my kids love is the idea of spreading Kiva through spreading Kiva to other kids. Like, you know, that idea of social action is let's bring some other people along, too. They're motivated by that. The second question that you asked is, are there US loans to loan to? And the answer to that is yes. And it was really interesting because when that first became an option, which was the spring of last year, our Kiva Club had a great internal debate about do we loan to kids or to people in the United States? Or should we just keep our loans to people in the developing world? And it was funny because the first loan that my kids pulled up from the US was a family. I think the dad was a computer technology engineer at some business. The GDP per capita was $43,000 a year. And this guy was trying to expand his business, which was um, he had like a trailer full of um, PlayStations that he would like pull up to your church so that you could have like a youth night. And your kids could go and play the PlayStations inside his trailer. And my kids were, it, it, my kids were really turned off by it. And they were turned off by it because the loan before that was for a woman who was trying to buy a motorcycle so that she could get to work each day in Malaysia. And if we looked at the picture, the motorcycle she was trying to buy was a moped, which blew the kids' minds. And more importantly, her kids were in the picture, and they weren't wearing any clothes. You know, they were naked. And so for my kids, that was just an eye-opener. It was like, are there poor people in the US that we could loan to? Sure. But for my kids, it became more important to loan to people in the developing world because they're so much more needy. It was a, re it was a really neat conversation. It's another instructional um, element to Kiva that you might not think of. And I'm going to go ahead and close up the show. And if anybody would like to stay on and continue asking questions, we invite you to do that. I haven't really seen any questions that we haven't addressed, but we invite you to do that in just a bit. We want to let you know that next Saturday on February the 19th, that we will have a very special guest, Karen Janowski, talking about reaching all learners AT tips and tricks at work. So we hope that you'll join us at the same time next Saturday. And Steve Hargadon will be interviewing David Perkins on Making Learning Whole on February the 15th. And on the 17th, that should be Thursday, um, he will be interviewing Kevin Kelly on What Technology Wants. And once you open the once you exit the session and open the survey, you can give us feedback on today's session, as well as let us know future topics and future uh, guests that you'd like to see on our show. We're always looking for that, especially those teachers that you'd like to see for the future teacher. And if for some reason the results are filled in from a previous time, just delete those. and input your new ones. And if for some reason that the survey does not open, I thought I copied it, but I'll copy it again. If for some reason the survey doesn't open automatically in your browser, you can always email us. And I'm looking for the, the link so that I can paste it in here. And then you can just access the survey, open it up in case you're having difficulties, because a few people have been having difficulties accessing the survey. Anyway, I'll find that survey link in just a bit. You can also, in that survey, request a professional development certificate. And if for some reason you're, that doesn't open, you can email us at live at classroom20.com. 
in the survey, just input your name and email address, and we will get those sent out to you. Peggy takes care of that. And we had a problem with the results <coughs> from last week. So you may have received a certificate if you didn't request one. Um, but give us a few days so we can get the results back from Illuminate, and then we will get that certificate out to you as soon as we possibly can. We also wanted to let you know that we have an iTunes U channel where you can subscribe to the MP3, the MP4, and the chat log of each of our shows. To open the channel, to open your browser and go directly into the iTunes U channel, you can type in tinyurl.com slash CR20Live iTunes U, all one word. And that will open up in your browser and take you directly so that you can take Classroom 2.0 live with you when where, wherever you go. And we'd like to extend a very special thanks to Bill for sharing today and taking time to join us on a Saturday morning. And to Steve Hargadon, who's the founder of our webinar series, and to Illuminate and Learn Central for allowing us to meet you know, this week and meet each week at the same time. We're just very grateful to them for that. So if there are additional questions that haven't been addressed, please uh, click on the hand with the green up arrow or continue to type the questions in the chat in case I might have missed some. We encourage you to, uh, and I found the survey link. We encourage you to take this time to ask your questions. You can always email Bill also after the show as well. So are there any questions that you'd like to ask? There's the survey link. You can click on it now and open up that in your browser in case you're having difficulty. And Bill. Um, do your students recruit research triangle business to help with Kiva? And I turned your mic off earlier, so be sure to turn it back on, though. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I've done some sponsorship work. Uh, we, we've actually, when we first got off the ground, we asked um, several local businesses and also our PTA. And we asked a couple of like local parent groups that are active in our community to um, become Kiva sponsors for $100. And we offered to put them on the back of our t-shirt. That was the, uh, the advertising return that they got. And we also offered to take their $100 and loan it out to four different people and to keep them posted about who those four different people were. And it worked pretty well. I think we ended up with eight. Um, groups that sponsored us at $100 each, which gave us a nice like seed fund to start with. Now, as far as going to the businesses in RTP and like looking for big time donations, uh, that was always our goal, but we haven't done it because that would that would really put a, a very uncomfortable stretch on our school's policies about fundraising. So we have to keep our Kiva stuff small. Now, there are two Kiva clubs um, that are run at the high school level. One's in the state of Washington and one's in the state of Texas that have done exactly that. And those two groups have like a ridiculous amount of money. I'm, I'm talking like hundreds of thousands of dollars that they manage and loan out, which I think is really neat. So the idea of approaching businesses is definitely something that r has run through my mind. But because of fundraising rules, we have to um, keep ourselves maybe a little smaller than that. Great, thank you for asking. Are there any other questions that you would like to have addressed? This will let Bill go. If so, just click on the hand with the green up arrow, or you can type them in the chat. And be sure to input in the survey some upcoming guests or topics that you'd like to see on our shows. We have some great things post um, coming up. 
And it looks like the questions are kind of winding down. So we're going to go ahead and close out today. But we want to remind you to please join us next Saturday. Uh, Karen will be joining us. And our recordings will be posted to our website at live.classroom20.com. And thank you very much. I do hope I get to feeling better soon. Um, I went and played in the little teeny bit of snow that we had at 1 a.m. when it snowed, since the snow is so rare. It was, I'm sick again after I just gotten better, but it was well worth it to play in the little bit of snow. <laughs> So anyway, we're going to go ahead and close down the recording and, and exit the session today. So thank you for joining us, everybody. It's been another fantastic session. And have a great day and weekend, everybody. See you next Saturday.